with demand expected to come back. The question remains, does this mean the economy is back on track? Companies now, after experimenting with offshore in places like India, Philippines, and Poland, want to bring those jobs back. We invest in the U.S. We're the biggest exporter in the country. In the cycle in right now, we're creating jobs. From Radio America, it's Neil Asbury's Made in America, the show that explores American industry, large and small, and promotes American-made products everywhere. Put Neil Asbury's Made in America to work for you. A very big welcome to you today. I'm your host, Neil Asbury, together with co-host Dr. Rich Rothman. Man, Rich, we're all fired up. A lot of things going on all around this. Very, very important stuff. I don't know where to start. There's so much to get through. But I got to tell you, you know, this election is already in full swing. And I can't believe, I mean, the things that we're hearing and how far uh, some of our presidential hopefuls are willing to go on all the free stuff, the free stuff. I mean, it's, it's amazing. I can't I can't imagine where we're going to be a year from now with all the free stuff. Well, I, 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 I think it's great. I mean, I, the more Bernie talks, the more stuff we're getting. I thought it was great yesterday. He said everyone gets a Learjet. I thought that was nice. <laughs> really? I thought it was really, really cool. That and how about the free that? puppies in Broadway uh, tickets, too? Free puppies, free Broadway tickets. And everyone gets to be in the reprise of West Side Story. Now, I thought that was very unusual, particularly for the New Yorkers, since they relate to that so well. So does that all mean that we get acting uh, 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 private lessons, too? Absolutely. We get that, and we get points in the show. Dance? Everybody dance gets a point in oh, the we show. we got to all learn how to dance and sing. Well, you know what's interesting? Because it reminds me of the movie The Producers. So Bernie's going to give away, you know, 1,000% of the 100%, and everyone Everyone gets something, but no one gets anything. How terrific is that? What a pro- I wish I could have done that. Well, I mean, up. if we if we did spend all this money, our currency would be even worth less than it is today. And uh, my goodness, uh, the the dollar would not be the global currency any longer. I can assure you of that. And poof, there goes the American dream. Hey, Rich, very pleased to have on the show right now Bob Moffitt from the Heritage Foundation, an incredible organization. He's coming on to talk to us about Medicare for All. I I think that that is becoming like the standard thing now. I mean, that's just kind of like where you start. Hey, Bob, I mean, so how are we going to pay for all this stuff? I mean, we look at some of the countries that have got this sort of a single-payer system. Health care is rationed. They seem to all come to our country if they want to have anything done quickly and to done and, and to be done with the latest technology. So, is that what we want to turn our country into? So, some some sort of a third world uh, 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 rationed health system here? I hope not. Uh, but you know, Mick Jagger just flew over from London not too long ago. Uh, went to New York to get a heart valve. And uh, the obvious <laughs> question why. is, <laughs> why did Mick Jagger of the Rolling Stones come to the United States to get uh, heart uh, to get heart surgery, advanced heart surgery, which is you know pretty serious? Stuff. I guess he figured out that he wouldn't be living by the time that his number came no, up. He saw the exotic Marigold Hotel movie. He understands <laughs> that he wouldn't no. have the time to wait. No, <laughs> that's that's the, the reason he couldn't get any satisfaction. <laughs> oh, <laughs> oh, I'm liking Bob. Now stock is going. Oh, now we are hey, digging look at deep. The brain on Bob. That is good. I'm, I'm, you All know, right. I got to use well, that. Well, you know, it, 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 he got it right. I think he got it right. Well, it's true. I mean, look, I mean, there, everybody knows that we've got problems in the American health care system. Uh, there's no question about it. It costs too much, frankly, in many respects. Uh, the quality is uneven. We do have extremely high quality in certain areas of the country and and uh, less less uh, less quality in others. And we still have problems with access, although right now about 90 percent of all Americans have health insurance coverage. Uh, the problem is is that under Obamacare, if you're in the individual market, you're getting slammed with huge premiums. And if you don't get subsidies, uh, you end up paying uh, premiums and deductibles that are equal to a second mortgage on your house. So that's the problem that we've got but right you, now in the market. Well, see, but, you know, Bob, that that is the problem. And that's what the, the media and the other folks out there in the mainstream and all the other you know politicians and so forth like Bernie and 
you know, all the others on the left and the far, far left progressive. They don't tell you that. You know, having a health care plan but not getting health care are two separate issues. You That's may exactly have a health care right. plan, but you can't afford the health care plan because you can't afford the deductible, co-pays, or anything else that goes along with that. So right. it may Unless, cost you ten grand in just to get in the hospital. Oh, I know, I know. Unless you get huge taxpayer subsidies, of course, which makes the whole program uh, a lot more uh, uh, a lot more expensive. You don't control costs by simply shifting costs to the taxpayer, which is what Obamacare does. But in any event, I think you know you raise a very good point. If you have a single payer system in the country, in other words, one source of health care serving 327 million Americans, and you make it free at the point of service, no copayments, no deductibles, you know, no, 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 uh, you know, no coinsurance or anything like that, you are going to set off an explosion of utilization. People will see it as a free good. And when you have a free good, as every economist in the world knows, every time you have a free good, uh, you know, you have an unlimited demand for the free good. And the unlimited demand slams right into the concrete wall of limited supply. And then government officials have to do stuff which is very unpleasant, like make decisions about who gets care, when they get care, how they get care, and under what circumstances they get care. And then you have Great Britain. You know, so, uh, so Bob, waiting lists you know, in Britain right now are very common. In fact, uh, four million people right now, as we speak, are awaiting hospitalization in Great Britain. And if you're in Canada, up to the north, primary care is not bad. But if you need specialized medical procedures, you've got to wait weeks and weeks and possibly months and months. And that's the way the, that's the way it works. You can't avoid it. So, Bob, you know, back when we got Obamacare and, you know, what was Nancy Pelosi, you know, you got to vote for it. So, you know, what's in it? I mean, that's yeah, yeah, you have to yeah, pass it read to, it, to read it, it. To, to read it or whatever yeah. that was. Yeah, that was but, a good one. But the left but the left back then was very focused on the, the single payer system, Medicare for all, the sort of thing that now in this presidential election we're going to be hearing a lot about. Sure. And, and those on the radical regressive left. Uh, you know, the, the regressives, they can't call them progressives anymore. They're putting us, uh, we're going backwards with this group. No, but, I got the word. I, insane. <laughs> but, just saying. Well, no, but I they, mean, but they, this is what they wanted. Something. This is what they wanted all along, and they didn't get it. And so now it's kind of like, okay, we got Obamacare. It didn't go enough. Now we're going to go for this. And And the Democrats believe, and probably they got good reason to believe, that the Republicans don't have an alternative, right? And so in the last midterm election, the Republicans, you know, were talking about getting rid of Obamacare, but they really didn't have anything to replace it with. And the Democrats used that very, very well uh, in this last election, saying they want to take your health care away and, you know, pre-existing yeah. conditions. And, and they're going to push that grandma anymore. over the cliff. And, and, and your kids can't be on your thing anymore. You know, yeah. once they're, you know, I think it's up until 26 or 27, they're going to take that away. Democrats use that very well. Will they, yeah, they be able did. to use the same sort of argument to get Medicare for all? No, I don't think they're going to be able to be successful with Medicare for all. They were successful attacking the Republicans in 2017 because, let's face it, the Democratic argument was exactly right. That is to say that after seven or eight years, the Republicans had an opportunity to put together a plan that was going to lower costs and expand choices and put a plan through the House and the Senate. They were able to get a plan through the House. They never got anything through the Senate. The fact of the matter is it was a terrible political and policy failure on the part of the Republicans in Congress. There is no question about it. Now, getting to the substance of things, everybody agrees that Americans should have access to health care, especially the sick and the vulnerable. I do not know one member of Congress who thinks that we ought to uh, uh, deny people uh, coverage because of some kind of a pre-existing condition. I do not know this person. If you ever find this person, please call me. I'm interested in talking to them. And, uh, you know, so they've done all this fear-mongering. Um, the, what we have been working on here is something called the Health Care Choices Proposal. And um, we've been talking to folks in the White House. The White House has been talking to us. And what our view is, is that what we've got to do is we've got to attack the problem of rising health care costs first. But in order to do that, you've got to recognize the facts on the ground. And the facts on the ground are pretty simple and pretty complex at one and the same time. The simple part 
is that one state insurance market is not like any other state insurance market. We have radically different uh, state insurance markets all over the country. And what we need is we need a health insurance regulatory regime that respects those differences. So state legislators should get back into the business that they've been doing for 100 years and to develop rules and regulations for their health insurance markets that are most compatible with the facts on the ground in their state, which recognize the differences in demographics, which recognize how many people are in poverty, how many people are on Medicare, how many people are on Medicaid, and and write rules that will basically deal with with those demographics. They've done it for 100 years, uh, so they can do it again. And that would actually eliminate a lot of the inflexibility, which is now driving health care costs through the roof in the individual and small group markets. That's step one, but it's only step one. Uh, we, our proposal would reduce premiums by about a third. About a 32% reduction in the individual market. Uh, we would keep the numbers pretty stable in terms of the number of people who have coverage, and it would even mod- modestly reduce the federal deficit. At this but, but, point. Bob, but Bob, one second, because we got well, we got like 30 seconds. But yeah, uh, go. <laughs> but I got to ask you this: How do they turn this into a campaign issue? How do they communicate this to the American people? How do they pull the rug out from the Democrats? What they feel right now that they have the moral high ground on health care and Republicans got nothing. So how well, do they I, how do they turn that around? I think they have to talk, I think they have to chew uh, gum and, and, and talk at the same time and uh, walk at the same time, talk at the same time. But they got to talk about what, in fact, the Democrats are offering and what the Democrats are offering is a first class horror. Uh, the Medicare for all proposals, which now are, are remember, it is endorsed by more than half, roughly roughly half of all House Democrats. Right. That will eliminate all patient choice of coverage. Hey, Bob, one, Bob, you know, Bob can, you, can you stick around for a moment? Because I want yeah, to get, sure. I, this is a very important issue. i got to cut for a short break. You don't want to miss this. Bob Moffitt from the Heritage Foundation talking about Medicare for all means pain for all. You don't want to miss this. Made in America. Welcome to Made in America. I'm your host, Neil Asbury, together with co-host Dr. Rich Rothman. And we're having a very passionate topic about health care, something that we should all be concerned about, with Bob Moffitt from the Heritage Foundation. So, Rich, I mean, you're itching to get into this discussion here in the end. <laughs> yeah. What's yeah. up? You know, here's my concern, and I'm anxious to hear Bob's comment on this. You see, Bob, I have a different philosophy in, in thought about this because I'm you know, I'm, I'm so conspiratorial about everything. See, I don't think this has anything. No, seriously. Yeah, you are. I don't. I, I can't help it. I'm a product of the 60s and 70s, and that's the way it goes. And the good news is my father paid for it, who, who was a conservative, by the way. But here, here's the deal. I don't think this has anything to do with health care. I don't think the whole Democratic conversation really has to do with health care. I don't think they even care about health care. What they do care about is control. And the one thing that we do not understand, and we've talked about this, Bob, for many, many years on this show, Saul Alinsky's comments, um, a, a concept for rules for radicals, one of them is control health care. If you control health care, you control the people and you have the power over the people. So under the ruse that, oh, we really care about you. Oh, my goodness. The Republicans are going to kill you. Grandma's going to die. She's not getting that kidney. But if you trust us, we're going to give you health care. You're going to get access to everything. They don't tell you that your doctor's going to be called Dr. Exit. So they're going to say, go to that go to that room that has exit over it, and you're going to go right out there. Just go down the stairs, and, well, you'll be in the parking lot, but they'll see you there. My feeling is, Bob, and I, I want your th- I'm sincere about this. I'm joking. Right. I'm very, very sincere. Right. I don't think the Democrats really care about health care. What they do care about is the ruse, the kabuki theater of the concept of health care. Get a hold of the people. Get a bill passed. Control the people. And I'm telling you, this all fits into their concept of big government controlling everything that they can do. It fits into everything they're doing right now on the progressive side. Bob, what do you think of that? Well, I think you're both. I think you're half right and half wrong. I think uh, with regard to the the policy analysts, the community that I deal with most, 
the academics, the policy analysts, the economists. I think with regard to those folks, when it comes to health care, this is what they think. Health care is very complex. It's a very, very difficult subject even to study. Uh, it is it is enormously it is enormously uh, complicated, uh, not only from the standpoint of understanding what it is that you need, which is good for your health, what is not, uh, and therefore we have to have some competent expertise that is going to guide and direct people who need help. I think the basic idea, and you've heard it expressed in different ways, but with them, I think it's really genuinely true that they think that. As a as a group, they know more than most people. They are smarter than other people, and they think that they know what is best for you. I think that's really the case with regard to uh, a lot of the people that I deal with. And I'm talking about people who are professional policy analysts uh, in in health policy who are on the left. The politicians is a different crowd. I think you're I think you're right about this. I think what they are governed by is really an expansion of power and i don't think there's anything surprising about that and there's nothing particularly novel about it actually we're talking about uh saul alinsky and the rules for radicals uh there is a uh, there is a lesson uh, that is even uh, older than that and it's found in saint augustine's city of god written at the time that the roman empire had collapsed and St. Augustine makes a very powerful argument. He says the problem with those in public life is that they are often governed by what he called libido dominandi, the lust for power. And there's no question about it. If you control one-fifth of the entire U.S. economy and you control the access uh, to care, and coverage of 327 million Americans. And if you can sit in an office and write a rule or a regulation or a guideline that will affect 327 million people, you are exercising more power than any medieval or modern monarch. It's just an amazing fact. And that's why the centralization of power in this area is so dangerous. So, because Bob, I mean, and, and, and if Bob, they I mean, make they a mistake, stop, they can they hurt. don't want to stop at health care. You know, we're talking no. about energy. The Green New Deal, isn't oh, that the same absolutely. thing? absolutely. Control the entire economy of the United States with that's a $93 right. trillion dollar takeover. Sure. And, and, that, and that's exactly why, when you look at the rules for radicals, it all fits in very, very nicely. The New Green Deal is devastatingly scary, if you think about it. If that ever were to come to pass, which I don't think it would. But no. then, then again, think about what else they're going to control. If they control education, well, then they control the next generation, well, then, don't they? Well, well they control well, education. Well, Bob, now. I mean, Bernie, Bernie just said the other day that, you know, he's going to blow up the, the Senate rules in order oh, to get yeah. Medicare for all. Maybe this oh, can yeah. happen. Maybe, you know, Bernie gets in and he blows up the Senate rules and they have a 50-50 sort of Senate. You yeah. know, he's saying One that, vote. look, you know, we're going to get rid of the filibuster. This is too important. We're going to do it. Yeah, but, you know, the founders had an answer for that, and that, that answer is the president and presidential vetoes. They have to get two-thirds to override it. That's, I, mean, I, I said think that the, Bernie, I think the I, yeah, founding fathers had a lot of understanding of the dangers that the lust for power that St. Augustine talked about, uh, that the dangers posed by that lust, uh, they had a very, very good idea about, you know, how to channel that and how to thwart it. But the yeah, but, Bob, but, that's, but I'm saying under a, under a Bernie presidency. Oh, gosh. <laughs> well, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. If, if this guy somehow gets elected, which a lot of people think he has a, a very good shot to do, and you had a 50-50 Senate, it could pass. And yeah, I got 15 Democrats. seconds. So yeah. that's, that's that's sorry all. about that. All right, Bob. <laughs> and your thoughts? Oops, we're done. <laughs> no, I think that we've. This, I think you're you're right. This is a serious business. I think Republicans who dismiss uh, Senator Sanders and the House Democrats as a bunch of fringe uh, personalities. I think they're making a terrible mistake. This is a hey. deadly serious proposal. Uh, it is comprehensive. It is well drafted. It is well thought out. It is a product of a lot of thinking, and they mean business. They want to hey, set the law. Hey Bob, it's been really great having you, man. A great, great, great way to wrap it up. I mean, you're right. Elections have consequences. That's where we got to end it. Bob Moffat, 
Heritage Foundation, very important issue. Stay tuned. Coming up, we have Mark Mills from the Manhattan Institute, and we're going to get back to that Green New Deal. Is it physically possible to do? We're going to talk about it. You don't want to miss it. Made in America. Sharply higher at the open, stocks continued to perform well over the course of the day Tuesday. And I think that bodes well here over the next couple of years for having bigger demands coming to this country. Now, more of Neil Asbury's Made in America. Welcome to Made in America. I'm your host, Neil Asbury, together with co-host Dr. Rich Rothman. Rich, it's just another day here at Made in America. We just got the uh, passions and the emotions flowing here. But a really great conversation with Bob Moffitt from the Heritage Foundation, uh, Medicare for All. And we talked about how the Democrats, you know, through legislation, wants to control the American economy. Controlling the economy means they have control over you. And that is not a good thing. Everything becomes a regulation, right? Who has health care? Well, let's regulate who has health care. What sort of health care do we have? Well, let's read another regulation. Well, of course. And then we talk about, you know, the other big part of that American economy, energy. We all need energy. We all need health care, right? And then that brings us to the Green New Deal. And uh, essentially legislating away uh, 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 carbon, carbon fuel, anything coming from carbon, right? Anything coming from coal, Anything coming from Hydro, oil? Any hydrocarbon is, is going to be outlawed. Everything. Can't right? have that. You can't have that. No. I mean, it means that, you know, there's no more plastics. I mean, there's no more. There goes the emergency room. They're out. Lubricants. There's no you know, more this. No more no ICU. More can't, can't plug grandpa in. Give him that, you know, extra blood he needs. That's not going to happen. Well, you know, if you control health care and you control energy, as Bob says, you got 327 million Americans just kind of dangling there. You become the puppet master. Wow, that's a scary thought. The puppet master. Anyway, coming on with us right now is Mark Mills from the Manhattan Institute going to carry on with this discussion. Mark, welcome to Made in America. I'm uh, delighted to join you guys. Thanks for having me on. So the Green New Deal, I, I, I read a piece recently uh, uh, that you authored, and it was about the Green New Deal, and is it physically possible to do? Can it be done? You know, it, it, you know, all of these batteries and things that we're going to need to power our electric cars and to get rid of um, uh, any, any sort of uh, uh, oil or carbon and our, our carbon-based economy, which is just everywhere. It's omnipresent. Can it be done? Do we have the manufacturing capacity? How long would it take to convert into a Green New Deal type of an economy? Uh, you know, it's easy to answer it in a short way, and you, you guys have already implied or directly answered the question. It's, the short answer is no. But listen, there, it, 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 there's no, there's actually not only no prospect. There's, there's, there's no, there's not a snowball's chance in Hades that the ideas that are being promoted can be done as a practical matter. But also, the underlying physics of the claims aren't possible but let me let me add something here though that that i've discovered i think is in people's minds and it's a weird dichotomy so when when um and it's become political the issue is as you know is highly politicized when it's kind of like saying an electron can be a liberal or a democrat electrons don't care right i mean a, a unit of heat doesn't care what your political affiliation is the law of gravity doesn't care i mean the, the, the pigs don't fly for a reason not because they're democrats or republicans they just don't fly because they're not eagles so the, the the approach i've taken on energy is really directed at understanding what the basic possibilities are but in doing this what i've discovered and you, you'll get this is that if i tell somebody and you probably have the same experience that it's not practical we can't afford it we don't have the manufacturing capacity those those answers have a response that's either implicit or explicit and that's wait a minute 
look what's happened with computers and cell phones. Look at this. Look at the incredible technology Silicon Valley has brought us. And you're telling me this ancient fuel that we're using, this oil we've been using for more than a century, coal for centuries, that we can't move on to the new stuff with new tech. The pace of change is so fast that we're facing this and you've heard this expression, exponential change in technology, and it's coming to energy, too. If you believe that's true, and a lot of people do, it's either in their heads or they're actually saying it, then somebody telling you that it's going to be too expensive is the equivalent of somebody saying in 1980s that, look, look at that IBM mainframe. You'll never get a computer in your pocket. Look what happened to computing. That's what's in people's heads. Well, which 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 you can understand how they would say that, except uh, if you think about that, the concept of computers and that technology took decades to get to the point of where they are, and we actually had the internet hit you know a little bit better in the '90s and so forth. But when you listen to people like you know the XL president John Hoffmeister, who uh, is out there uh, talking about this very very often, pretty smart guy, and, and he basically says that we just you know, can we get to that point someday? Yeah, maybe we can. 50, 60, 70, 80 years from now, we can do that. But to get the critical mass of mega energy that we need to power a city, that can't happen with any of the technology that we have right now because we don't have the critical mass in that technology to run a city. So it's really not apples to apples, as some of these folks, as you very aptly just pointed out, we try and explain. Well, it's actually – so Hoffmeister is, is – and, and God bless him because he's one of the few uh, former oil execs who's out preaching the gospel of reality. So this is great to see. No, he's so fun many, to listen to. I enjoy him a lot. He's terrific. And so many of the oil companies, the majors, are, are you know, hiding behind green, green-washed skirts to say that they, you know, they're worried about uh, climate change and they you know, are genuflecting to the need to change. But they, they're doing it – and I, I guess I understand why they're doing it uh, – because they don't want to argue the issue, and, and rather than argue it, they know the world's going to use lots of oil and gas, so it's simply just concede it and move on and keep producing oil and gas. But it's actually two parts, and Hoffmeister is saying only half the story, and that is you're right about the scale, and, and there's a way to put the scale in context. The, you know, the, it took, the world uses lots of energy because you can't do anything without energy. It took the world 50 years to increase oil production tenfold. And a tenfold increase was required uh, over history to fuel growing economies and more people. So it took 50 years to increase tenfold. The green plans that everybody is pushing on the other side of the equation would require a 90-fold, not tenfold, a 90-fold increase in energy production in less than half the time. It's just not, even if the stuff were the same price, even if it were just as effective, we clearly are not, don't have the capability. The money doesn't exist. The industrial infrastructure doesn't exist. So, hey, Mark, 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 we're going to have to leave it right there for a second. Uh, we're going to come right back to your point, hold that point. We've got to uh, stop for a quick break. You don't want to miss it. Mark Mills, Manhattan Institute, talking about the Green New Deal and how practical really is it. You don't want to miss it. We're going to be right back. It's going to be exciting. Great stuff. Made in America. Welcome to Made in America. I'm your host, Neil Asbury, together with co-host Dr. Rich Rothman. And we're together with Mark Mills from the Manhattan Institute talking about the Green New Deal, and it is physically impossible in order to pull this thing off. (laughs) The production, uh, the technology uh, just doesn't exist in what it would do to our economy and all of that. But, Mark, let me um, talk about a headline here for a sec. Um, President uh, Trump this past week has signed a bill that's going to make it a lot harder for local municipalities and states uh, to stop pipelines. And, you know, of course, with the Keystone Pipeline and, you know, Rich and I have done a lot of discussion about that and, you know, all the courts and everybody getting involved and, you know, the jobs it would create and then, you know, all the disruption that that uh, some people said it would cause to the environment. And, you know, uh, the it, it was a real mess. And you just get some activists, activist judge 
you know, somewhere. And they all know where to file the lawsuits because they know what judge is going to be there. Does the number nine come to mind? Just (laughs) saying, number nine? They know, you know, they know the outcome. So, okay, well, let's take it to this judge. You know, he'll just uh, rule for us because he's an idologue. And so, therefore, we know we got him in our back pocket. It does work both ways, but it's certainly uh, been utilized in the last couple of years. So, sorry, long, long way of asking. So what has President Trump done to prevent this sort of thing happening? And if a pipeline gets approved, it gets built instead of gets hung up in the courts for, well, forever. Well, I mean, this is a he's not he's not the right thing here, and it and actually, if you think about it, the, uh, the the folks who like wind turbines should be happy about this, because the interstate commerce movement of energy is critical. I mean, this is why we have interstate commerce clauses, and why the Constitution has uh, you know constitutional laws upheld the right of uh, the government, the federal government, to preempt some local uh, you know controls over moving goods across state lines, pipelines, transmission lines, highways, because otherwise we couldn't have our economy function. Right? If everything, everything stopped at every state border and you had to fight constantly, you would, you would uh, bottleneck everything. So even if you like wind turbines, you should like this kind of approach because it's, uh, it's uh, legally and economically sound. This, but the importance here on oil and gas is uh, particularly interesting because the United States is producing so much oil and gas so fast that every pipeline that was built in the country to bring oil and gas from the coast to the heartland has been reversed. We're building pipelines because you can't get the stuff out of the country fast enough. The United States is now a net exporter of energy. We became a net oil exporter for two weeks last year. By next year, we'll be a permanent net oil exporter. In a few years, we'll export more oil than Saudi Arabia. That's the track we're on. This is an astonishing reversal. But the key to this stuff is pipes, our pipes, getting, getting this stuff out of the country. And, and you know, the uh, uh, anti-oil and gas movement know that. That's why they, they try to, to use every legal tactic possible to stop the building of pipes. Pipes are extremely economical and safe way, an environmentally sound way to move oil and gas. So it's, uh, well, Richard, it's well, Rich, I mean, the, the, the key word there is that they're safe. They are. Well, yeah, we they're knew they, they were much more safe than, the than dealing against... Burlington Northern and having the you know the cars of a train overturned at least once or twice a year. You have that happen, but there's another aspect to that, and that's the political aspect. Ac- uh, you know, uh, aspect. Uh, aspect. Thank you very much. <laughs> that when we were discussing cronyism in the last administration, one of the things that we realized is that those who own Burlington Northern, uh, you can figure who that one is, uh, was making an awful lot of money, and and the pipeline. Would be safer, faster, efficient. Yeah, right. Would be hidden from sight, basically, and at the same time, would make it the transport of, of energy that much cheaper, economical, uh, and it would uh, uh, improve America's uh, trade deficit. So, is, is is that part of it? Is that part of it, Mark? I mean, is that is it that the political interests are economically aligned against it because it's not good for them? Well, it's I mean, not good look, for their for their wallets. We we, we know that there's a kind of. Uh, kleptocracy that's built up around uh, so-called green options on, on people who are interested in building wind turbines and batteries and solar arrays. I mean, it's, it's transparent. It's easy to figure out. Uh, the, the, and you, you could argue, I mean, you could say everybody has a self-interest. I'm, I'm okay with self-interest in free markets. It, you know, you, if you produce wind, wind turbines, you produce oil, you have a self-interest in, in promoting and pushing. What I, what I oppose, and I'm sure you guys do, is uh, tilting the playing field using taxpayers' money to give an advantage to your, your energy or your product or your source. And this is what we've done. We've put roadblocks up against people who produce oil and gas, but we use taxpayers' money, which is another way of saying the middle class, we use their money to subsidize a technology that the market otherwise wouldn't buy. If it weren't for the subsidies, we would have a fraction of the wind and solar and battery technologies in the country. You can't argue that the subsidies are making the technology magically cheaper. The subsidies continue, and the industry lobbies for them precisely because they can't compete without them. This is a bad way to run an economy. Well, but we also know, which is where very those are all very valid points, that energy is also part of not just the economy, but in terms of leverage in dealing with other economies in the sure. world. Of I mean, course. I think President Trump has placed us in a wonderful position to go head to head with Russia and give them a big scare by 
being exactly what you know Mark just pointed out before, a net exporter of energy and, and soon to outpace what uh, the uh, Saudis are doing. And obviously, if we can get much more of our product into Eastern Europe, then we really you know, hit home to Russia. So it makes well, an awful lot of right. sense for us to go down this road. Well, you're, uh, you're absolutely right. In fact, the prospect, not the fact, but the mere prospect of the United States exporting natural gas in liquid form caused the gas prices globally to collapse and caused forced Gazprom, Russia's gas company, to reduce their prices selling into Europe. They're lobbying hard against it because that's their only source of revenue. And, well, not only. 70% of the revenues come from exporting oil and gas, so it dominates it. So the, the entrance of the United States as a uh, not only eliminating the U.S. as an importer, but creating us as an exporter, has put us into a whole new geopolitical era of soft power, which is critical. The world consumes an extraordinary quantity of oil. It will for a long time. And We're coal. And coal. We're also the Saudi Arabia of coal, too. Let's not forget coal. Right. Natural gas. Absolutely. The, the, the hydrocarbons, as you guys know, supply about 80 84 percent of the world's energy, and they do the same in the United States. There is no forecast of any kind, including the optimists at the International Energy Agency, that sees it dropping significantly below 79 or 80 percent for two decades or three decades. Well, that's a long time. Hey, Mark, uh, great, great, great that, you with, that you're with us today. We really appreciate it. Fortunately, we're out of time, but we're going to be talking about this for a long time. It's going to be a big, big issue. Come back and join us again soon, Mark. You bet. Thank you. Coming up, Dr. Rothman and I are going to have some final thoughts for the day. Can you believe that we're already there? You don't want to miss it. Made in America. Welcome to Made in America. I'm your host, Neil Asbury, together with co-host Dr. Rich Rothman. Hey, Rich, boy, time flew by. But there is always headlines, always something to talk about. This week, there was a headline, Walmart is rolling out robots in response to minimum wage hikes. So we've seen it in fast food. Mm -hmm. Now we're seeing, we've seen it in logistics. Very big, very big, and now we're seeing it in retail. And and what they're doing is amazing. And number one, of course, they can clean the floors and get all that done, but they're scanning the shelves, Neil, and they're finding out what's on the shelf, what needs to be placed on the shelf. And guess what? That used to be run by somebody who was, you know, actually a human being going by with a pad or whatever, an iPad, and taking individual notes. That's now being done by AI, something we've been covering for many years now. Very, very, very fascinating, and uh, we haven't seen the end of that. I no. think that you know, as it's just getting started, as this big pressure on minimum wage and so on, it's it's you're going to see a lot more of that. Hey, we talked about Bernie earlier. Here's a headline: that Bernie Sanders isn't he the guy who's all about the climate change thing and oh, carbon yes. footprint? Very, very concerned about that. Very concerned. Well, well, this past week while he was campaigning, he demanded a private jet. A private jet. Now, that private jet has a much larger carbon footprint than my SUV. I don't know how many SUVs you would have to have. It has a much larger car, a carbon footprint than my 1966 big block Corvette. Yes, it does. But on the other hand, on the <laughs> other hand, it does serve Johnny Black. And I don't know if you have that in your big block Corvette, <laughs> but it does. And and you know what? It, it is amazing. I love all these these elites on the progressive side. You know, it, it, listen, I spent a lot of time in Cuba over the last few years. I, I've been there a, a gazillion times. And and you got to tell you something. The average Jane and Joe, you know, uh, Juan over there has a really bittersweet life. But the elites, Neil, there's BMW, there's Mercedes-Benz, there's Lexus. They're all in Cuba. And who do you think drives them? The foreigners are coming here from Europe, but at the same time, the elites in Cuba. So all the elites, you know, they're living the it life that everybody else wanted to live, and they're saying you can't do that. It's not fair. Well, there you go. There, That's what happens in socialist countries, right? Listen, Sanders has spent... 
Uh, is since, that why they call them Democrats, Socialists, Socialist Democrats? Is that is well, that why? Well, they call them that because they ran East Berlin to because the ground. They, because they 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 want us to live a certain very a very ascetic life. And well, we, we, well, we got to all turn into don't kind you, of monks. Don't you, you right? think it's fair that you? You should not have a holiday. You should not have a car. You should take public transportation because somebody else should have health care and you should be paying for that. Therefore, you have to give it up. Of course, the elites don't do that. But by the way, Sanders has spent 300, according to a Politico, $342,000 on private jets since 2016 when he was running for office again for the presidency. And he's going to be doing it again. Oh, you know, they're just getting started. It's demanded, demanded, demanded that he flies it and he really prefers it. And and I understand why it's an awful lot of fun when you fly private jets. But then again, if the if the Green New Deal goes in, maybe maybe he'll like you know trains. <laughs> you know, maybe he'll like trains. I don't know. I, you know, I'm not sure about that. Okay, well that's kind of exciting. So um, what else? I mean, you, you you read so much. There's so many things to talk about. I got to turn it over to you. Well, what I what I find interesting uh, uh, this week. Is that, um, you know, we talk about the, the, I don't think people don't really understand. Get back to Walmart for a second. This concept of uh, demanding a minimum wage, whether it's going to be 14, 15, and, and if you're out in Oregon and Washington, they want to do like 17 or $18 an hour. There are going to be, according to others that are out there, a tsunami effect as a result of that. Neil, they are going Meaning to a be. a tsunami effect of, 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 of not having jobs. Yes, or, exactly. Or, or cutting jobs. back, cutting back on hours. Cutting back on hours and at the same time cutting back on jobs, just like you just pointed out very aptly. You know, Walmart. Walmart's going to be using more uh, artificial intelligence and lowering the number of people that they have on their payroll. So it, you're going to have that effect. But there's one thing I, I, I actually look for, and, and I found it interesting, because I know you lived in the Philippines for a while, right? Oh, I'm for And you're married years. to a beautiful Philippine, Philippine woman. Exactly. A movie star. Is a yes. Neil is married to a Philippine movie star. This man is lucky. I just want you to know that. <laughs> I know her. I've seen her. She's magnificent. But they just found out, listen to this, they found out they have fossil, e- this is no joke, they have fossil evidence of a new human species Found in the Philippines. I wonder if I wonder if that's uh, socialist Democrats. I don't know what it is, but it did have a closet <laughs> full of shoes. I, I, that's how it was a dead giveaway. Just, just one. No, I mean, no. In all sincerity, it's on the internet. Folks can check it out right now. Yeah. Well, I mean, this is the world we live in. Hey, look, you got to laugh, right? You got to laugh. I mean, everything going on around us. You got to find humor. Don't lose our sense of humor. I know I talk to a lot of people and they always say, can you believe this? And can you believe that? Can you believe what's going on in our country? Hey, look, we've been there before. We've always come through. We're going to come through again. You know, we're going to debate it. We're going to talk about it. Time heals. Things pass. Hey, look, you know, remember, remember what was it? The, uh, you know, on the on the Republican side, you know, you had uh, the conservative side, you know, you had all that big movement that you, you started out with Newt Gingrich and the contract with America. And, that worked well. Yeah, it did. But, you know, it's it's behind us. And now you got the socialist Democrats. They're going to be behind us, too, here before. Hey, Rich, we're out of time. I can't believe it. Fun show but today. don't be sad because we're going to be back again next week for another adventure of Made in America where we never stop fighting for your jobs. <laughs>